Have you tried training methods that just didn't work? Do you feel that your pet is not getting his or her nutritional needs met? Are illnesses and bad behavior your daily norm? You're going to want to join me on the Pet Parenting Reset, where you'll hear interesting and informative interviews and get solutions to all your pet problems. I'm your host, Jessica L. Fisher. Well, hello and welcome back to the Pet Parenting Reset with me, Jessica Fisher. I am so, so happy that you are returning or if this is your first podcast with me, I hope you follow along and subscribe. I think it's just a follow, right? That's that's what it's called. Um, but today we are talking about prescription pet foods or veterinary pet foods. And y'all, I have I have so many notes because there's so many things I want to tell you. And I'm I'm trying not to honestly, we could probably talk about this for hours and hours and hours. I'm gonna try to condense it as much as I can because it is so important. Um, to knowledge is power, no matter what we're talking about, no matter which situation we're in, whether it's to do with our pets, ourselves, our friends, our family, um, the world in general, knowledge is power, right? Like the more we know, the better informed we are, the better we can assess situations and make informed decisions. Now, before I get into this, I want to say I am in no way um, vet bashing or saying that veterinarians um, are not doing the best they can. I wholeheartedly believe that our veterinarians absolutely are doing the absolute best we can. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about how we can, how we can talk to our vets and about food in ways that are not confrontational, but inclusive. So let's get into why I even wanted to have this topic to talk about. It is it's so important because I know more than once in my life, I have been pressured into purchasing a prescription pet food or veterinary pet food, depending on which food you purchase. Um, prescription pet food is actually trademarked. So there are there's a company that can use it, and then other companies have to call it veterinary pet food. Uh, so it may be called different things depending on what you're purchasing. There have been more than more than once in my life um, through my pets that I have been, I have felt pressured into purchasing veterinary uh, or prescription pet foods multiple times because I just didn't know any better and I didn't know the right questions to ask. I bought it and I fed it for extended periods of time. Um, fortunately, the last time it was uh, pushed upon me. In fact, the last couple of times it was pushed upon me. I knew better. I had, I had good information. I had, I had questions to ask that. And and fortunately, my previous veterinarian also understood where I was coming from, and she said, "I get it." you know, you are, she's, she on more than one occasion, occasion told me that I research more than she does. So <laughs> um, go for it, girl. Right. But so let's talk a little bit about prescriptions or veterinary prescription or veterinary diets, depending on, on the brand. It's going to be called a couple of different things. First and foremost, there is no medicine in this food. And because there is no medicine in this food it is not FDA regulated. Also, because there is no medicine in this food, there are no medical trials done on it. In fact, there's no additional testing required at all upon the uh, pet food companies to state that it does anything above and beyond what their regular pet foods do. And the only testing required, you, you either have to have, um, you either have to be balanced to AFCO minimum nutrient requirements or undergo AFCO trials. And we'll talk a little bit about AFCO trials here in just a minute. But one important thing to know, actually, let's go ahead. W one important thing to know about AFCO trials is that you only have to have 10 animals in the trial. Um, and this is information that I got from Dr. Katie Woodley. Uh, you only have to have 10 animals in the trial. The trial only lasts six months and only eight out of those 10 animals have to survive. 
<laughs> How insane. Like if our medical trials or our food trials were that way, we would be up in arms. That is insane. So those are the two. Um, one, uh, your, your pet food has to undergo one of two, right? Um, or <clears throat> if they don't do either of those, they have to say that they're not balanced. Um, they are not, they don't meet minimum nutrient requirements on the label. Or instead of saying that, instead of like explicitly saying that, they may say feed as a supplement or not um, to be fed as, a, as your pet's main food source or something like that, right? So what we do need to do is talk to our vet. And if you can't talk to your vet, if you have tried talking to your vet and they are not up for talking to you, my opinion, my my best, like the, the best advice I can offer would be to, to seek out another veterinarian or, and, and or, <laughs> because I think it is almost just as important to have a team, have a medical team. You don't just see one doctor for everything your whole life, right? There are lots of different um, specialties out there. And I think it's important to assemble a medical team for our pets as well. Uh, so how can you do that? Of course, you'll have your primary care veterinarian, right? Which is probably an allopathic veterinarian, a traditional medicine veterinarian with um, Eastern medicine veterinarian. Uh, you can add to that even a second veterinarian, like getting a second opinion is a-okay. Of course, we all want to have that emergency veterinary office on speed dial, just in case. Um, and seeking out a holistic veterinarian is also a great way to do that. Um, there are both holistic and homeopathic veterinarians who do telehealth. So that is another really great way to round out a medical team for your pet. And the reason why you need the primary care vet to begin with is because you need somewhere to go um, if something happens, right? Monday through Friday, you need somewhere to go to get labs done. Uh, especially if you're doing telehealth with a holistic or homeopathic veterinarian, they're gonna need that information to help inform their decisions. Um, but the reason I say that in regards to food is because they can also help you in, in, in fact, holistic and homeopathic veterinarians like make it a point to learn more about pet food and pet nutrition. Whereas a traditional veterinarian, that is just not something they know much of anything about. And we've talked about this in the past that the information that they do have, which is generally one course, one semester in vet school is funded uh, by one of the big pet food companies, depending on what vet school they go to is, is going to depend on, on the pet food company. I do have to throw in here, I, I am not saying that there is never any benefit to a prescription or veterinary diet. That This is where you have to do your best to make informed decisions for your pet, have open and honest conversations with your veterinarian. In fact, in just a little bit, I have some slides that I'm going to pull up on the screen. Now, if you're listening to the podcast, um, thank you so much, by the way. But I'm going to go over these slides in a way that hopefully you won't feel like you're missing anything. However, if you do want to see the slides, um, the day after this podcast airs, you can view the video on either YouTube or Rumble. Um, yeah, so the slides will come up. Um, but, but again, I'm going to hopefully <laughs> cover the slides in a way that uh, if you're on the podcast, if you're just listening and you don't have the audio, you're still going to be able to follow along um, because it's it's uh, ingredient lists on pet food. We're going to compare prescription dry, prescription wet, and then regular dry, regular wet of one single brand. And then I actually did it for two different brands. So we can we can kind of look and give you an idea of how to go about looking at these labels and, and bringing, bringing these labels to your veterinarian and saying, well, this is the label on this food and this is the label on this food. Uh, now, for, let me say, there is more to a pet food than just the ingredient label, but that is one of the best ways that we as consumers can look at a product and say, okay, okay. Now, let's, let's, th this makes sense to me. I don't, why would we put this ingredient before the, so, when I get to it, you'll understand it a little bit more, but what's what's probably going to happen is your vet is going to either have to admit 
that they don't know, they don't know, and that's okay, right? Like, don't shame them about it. Let's, hopefully, it's going to make them do some more research and learn a little bit more about the products they're selling in their office, right? And very possibly, they're going to look at those labels and say, my goodness, this one does look better, right? Or, and, and we're going to talk about, we're also really quickly before I get into the slides, let's go ahead and talk about how there are benefits to adjusting a diet depending on medical issues that your pet has. So the idea of adjusting your pet's food based on a medical issue is great. Yes, absolutely. The foods they're <laughs> promoting to do so, in my opinion, uh, I would never buy again in my life. Not to say I haven't. Again, I have. I have purchased them, um, but I have educated myself enough to understand that they're not all they're cracked up to be. And that's the point of this podcast. It's not to tell you, oh my gosh, these are horrible, never buy this. No. In fact, it's to tell you, let's become a little bit more educated and hopefully in the process encourage our veterinarians to become a little more educated as well because maybe you do your research and you say you know what this is the best i think i can do right now and that is okay right the best we can do is the best we can do <laughs> and the real reality is that these prescription and veterinary diets are insanely expensive. If you have a pet on a prescription or veterinary diet and you're looking at what you're spending, let me tell you, in in all probability, you could very likely switch your pet to a much healthier, much healthier fresh food diet, get similar to same results depending on what adjustment needs to be made based on their medical condition. Again, I'm not a veterinarian, but you can consult with veterinarians, holistic and homeopathic veterinarians. Um, even there are um, uh, pet nutritionists out there, and I can definitely point you in the right direction to one I know in particular who can help you with medical issues and save a ton of money. Like your pet is going to get better care, better food and save money. But again, I digress. <laughs> so yes, there can be benefit at times. So uh, again, I'm not saying never ever in a million years buy these things. I personally wouldn't, but it depends on the animal. And, and again, I don't know how many times I've said this. I got this from Kimberly at keep the tail wagging, but feed the dog in front of you. And, um, Feed, feed the dog in front of you or feed the cat in front of you because they're all individuals and they're all different. So there is never, like, it's, it's like a never say never situation. I'm never going to be up here saying never, never, never do that. Well, eh, I'd like to sometimes, but there are always extenuating circumstances. Always, always, always. So maybe, you know, your, your cat has a urinary issue, urinary blockage issue, possibly, or um, your dog has uh, gut upset, digestive issues. These, there may be supplements added, there may be um, protein decreased, depending on what medical issue your pet has going on. That's the idea behind these prescription or veterinary diets is, and, and for joint support, support, right? They're going to add things like, um, glucose, the, the. for joint support, right? They're going to add things like glucose. Why can't I talk today? They're going to add things like glucosamine, um, or omega-3 fatty acids. And in all reality, you could continue feeding the food you were feeding or even a better food, right? And add in your own whole food supplements or supplements that you have done your own research on and you know they are the highest quality um, that you can get and add your own glucosamine and omega-3 fatty acids and get the same for less. Like you're spending less, you're getting a higher quality product and you're also not 
you know, tied to going to your vet's office every week or two weeks to buy a, a, a bag or can of food, right? Plus, on top of everything else, and I know we've talked about kibble. I know I have, I have talked about kibble. I could continue to talk about kibble until the cows come home. But um, we know that kibble is high heat processed. We know that it keeps our pets in a con constant state of dehydration. Um, and this is a like it's bad for our dogs, but it's especially bad for our cats. Cats need a ton, a ton of moisture. Just for example, if you have a cat with urinary issues, just increasing their moisture, just increasing their water intake, just in switching from a dry food to a wet food can make a world of difference for your cat, right? So especially in the case of a urinary issue, like there is, there's about, there's about zero chance, um, that if I had a cat with a urinary issue who was on a kibble dry food that I would recommend, there, there is zero chance I would recommend keeping them on a dry food, like zero chance, um, that I would recommend that. And I know many, many veterinarians and other just people in the pet space who would, who would say the same thing because moisture is so incredibly important for cats, especially ones with urinary issues. And, and to just throw fuel on the fire, right? Kibble also produces advanced glycation in products and chemicals. Like that is the end result of creating a kibble. You're getting, you're getting what ultimately leads to carcinogens in the end product of a kibble. It's sad, but it's true. So, and, and, and any kibble, like no matter what you, like we were talking about earlier, I made a note here. That's why I, I was saying and, and like that. We were talking about earlier AFCO trials, right? But any trial that a pet food has, they never, ever, ever, 100% never test in, for inflammation in the body. Now, you know, like we know with great certainty that kibble produces inflammation in the body. So of course they wouldn't want to check for it. But if we think about what is the underlying cause of any disease, any, literally any disease, it's inflammation. So that, that one little snippet, that one little tidbit out with anything else, literally anything else we could talk about with kibble, that one little tidbit should be a red flag for any and everyone. But anyway, just one little tiny little rant on the side about kibble. So let's pull up. There we go. We've got our slides. So on this first slide, and I'm not divulging the brands of these intentionally. I'm not calling out brands, period. Um, there's, yeah, there's good reason because of course I don't want these brands coming back on me. I'm not putting any information out there that isn't public knowledge. I'm just putting it together in a format that hopefully pet parents can easily digest and understand. So this particular brand, this is brand one. This is a prescription dry cat food and it's for um, urinary issues in cats. Now, like I just said, there is literally zero chance I would ever recommend keeping a cat with a urinary issue on a dry food. Ever, ever in a million years, no period, end of sentence, end of story, <laughs> end of sentence, end of story. Um, so the very first ingredient is chicken byproduct meal. So let's dissect that a little bit so that you understand chicken byproducts in and of itself is not necessarily a bad thing. It's not necessarily a good thing either. It's really a catch all for any part of a chicken that isn't fit for human consumption um, or humans don't want to consume. So that could be organ meat. That could be, um, you know, I hate to say this, but especially if we're talking about a larger animal like a cow or even a pig, if there are, if there's cancer found in an animal, they're going to salvage what they can for human consumption and cut out the cancerous part. That cancerous part is byproduct that goes into pet food. Um, so that's why I say it's not, it's not necessarily bad, but it's not necessarily good either. So it's really a catch-all term 
that I don't love, but it's better than a lot of other things that we're going to see on an ingredient label. Meal, however, just turns this on its head because any meat meal, any chicken meal, beef meal, pork meal, turkey meal, whatever it may be, a meal product means it has already been rendered down. So it's whatever... We've talked in the past about how pet food kibble is high heat processed. And in many cases, that's up to four times. It, it, it depends on the pet food, on the, brand, on the brand, on the particular food, yada, yada, yada. So when a company lists a meat meal product, before they ever get that ingredient, it's already rendered high heat process and rendered down one time. So there's little to no nutritional value in that product to begin with when it gets to the pet food company to put into the food. So the, the more, more processes, the more high heat these um, products undergo, the more we get these advanced glycation in products, the more we get these um, chemical carcinogens that uh, are present in the food. So that's a big, big no-no for me right off the bat, that it's a meal product. So it's chicken byproduct meal. No, thank you. Brewer's rice, corn, corn gluten meal. Now, <laughs> um, there's, they're doing ingredient splitting here because corn and corn gluten meal, they're both corn, right? Now, Yes, they're different in that we just talked about how a meal product is already rendered down, high heat processed one, once before it gets to the pet food company, but they're, they're corn. And the reason that companies, pet food companies do this, they're allowed to do this, um, is because it's called ingredient splitting. And basically what happens is if they were to lump all of this product into corn, right? To just list corn, the way an ingredient label go, like the, the list, the listing of product is that the very first product is the largest percentage. And then it goes down from there. So if they were to put these two corn products together and just list corn on the ingredient label, it would, it would more than likely be the very first um, product on the ingredient list. And Pet food companies don't want to do that. They want you to see that beautiful chicken word first. They don't want you, they don't even want you to read past chicken. They just want you to see chicken. They don't even want you to see the byproduct meal, right? They just want you to see chicken. And it's tricky. It's, 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 in my opinion, deceiving. Um, but that's how things go. Um, also, you know, we know that what are where are we looking at? Corn, wheat, um a, a lot, you know, these, these grain products um, are some of the worst offenders for glyphosate, which is Roundup, which we know is a cancer causing agent. Um, so we don't want to see these. Uh, <laughs> we don't want to see these anyway, but nonetheless, there they are. Chicken fat, wheat, gluten, again, wheat. I was just talking about um, how they're sprayed uh, with Roundup with glyphosate. Natural flavors. I hate seeing natural flavors. Like period, end of story. I hate seeing natural flavors in pet food and my food because it's a catch-all term. They don't have to tell you what it actually is. A lot of times they have phthalates and things like that. You just, they're nasty, nasty, nasty. So here we see wheat again. So we got wheat gluten and we've got wheat. Again, there's an ingredient splitting. And then salt. So what's important about salt on the label is, is something we call the salt divide. And that means, so generally speaking, it is, it is considered in the pet food industry that salt is never more than 1% of um, the ingredients in a product. So everything after salt is going to be less than 1% 1 per, 1 or less, basically. So while we want to look past salt, the main ingredients are going to be before salt. And the reason we want to look past salt is because we're going to see, oh, what's right past salt? Cellulose. I hate cellulose. It's it's nasty, nasty, nasty. It's basically like a, a plastic compound. So, okay, this one has DL methionine. Now that is that is what basically they're using to call this a prescription food because it's it's bringing down, it's helping to bring down the pH, basically. 
So let's move on to the next. We're still sticking with brand one. This is the um, prescription urinary wet cat food. So this one is going to be, let's see if I can get that off of the screen. There we go. Okay. So this one, this one, in my opinion, is inherently better uh, because of the moisture content, especially when we're talking about urinary issues. So we're talking about water sufficient for processing. Of course, we're going to see that um, pretty much the first ingredient on any uh, wet food. Pork byproducts. So again, like I was saying, it's not necessarily good. It's not necessarily bad. Definitely better than meal. It's not a meal. So we're looking at pork byproducts. Chicken liver, that's great. Chicken byproducts, okay. Wheat gluten, don't love it. Wheat flour, don't love it. Natural flavors, don't love it. <laughs> um, where are we at? Modified cornstarch, pork plasma, powdered cellulose, don't love cellulose, vegetable oil, salt. There's the salt, okay. So that's everything that's uh, above 1%. Salt is uh, right about 1%. So let's look past, so we're already like way better, way, way better than the dry food product, right? So the DL methionine is what they're using uh, in the product to help with urinary support. Um, so we are seeing that in here. And I'm just looking to see, I'm not seeing carrageenan which I, I appreciate very much. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. Okay, so already we're looking at this thinking, okay, better than the kibble, right? Better than the dry food for a urinary cat. Still not excellent, um, but it is what it is, right? <laughs> so if we are gonna stick with a veterinary or prescription um, pet food, especially if we're talking about urinary, we are, we're definitely looking at the wet, you know, wet food being better than the dry food. So we're sticking with brand one and this one might be a little bit, you know, the ingredient list was much more significant. So the, the text is a little bit smaller. This is a dry cat food, not a prescription food, just a generic, you know, all around adult dry cat food, the same brand, brand one we've been talking about. Corn is the number one ingredient then barley, then wheat, then chicken meal. We talked about meal, corn gluten meal, soy protein isolate, natural flavors, chicken fat, wheat gluten, brewer's rice, dried plain, beet pulp, vegetable oil, pea fiber, fish oil, calcium sulfate, rice hulls, grain distillers, dried yeast, uh, potassium chloride, egg product, psyllium seed husk, sodium silico aluminate, sodium bisulfate, sodium pyrophosphate, fruit, uh, the, the saccharide, something that I can barely pronounce, choline chloride, calcium carbonate, vitamins, um, which there are lots of vitamins they have added here. I'm looking like I haven't got to, oh, oh my goodness. There's so many different vitamins and su supplements added. Um, folic acid, vitamin D. Okay. Taurine, DL methionine, which you know, why would they even need that in there? But I guess they feel they do. Potassium citrate, then salt. Okay, we got to salt. So I'm not even seeing chicken meal, which we just talked about, is has already been rendered down high heat process before it gets to the pet food, which then again is going to go mul undergo multiple high heat processing. There's little to no nutritional value in that when it gets to the pet food company, much less by the end of this. So I'm not seeing it, like, where is the meat coming from? This is a cat food. Cats are obligate carnivores. Um, what we know about obligate carnivores even is that in the wild, their carbohydrate intake is generally recognized about 3% and a house cat, ideally around 7%. I don't even see where there's chicken fat, but where's the meat coming from? That's why there are so many vitamins and minerals added before salt, because they're trying to make up for the fact that there is no meat in here. So I, I'm just, I, I don't, I don't love this. <laughs> where's, where's the meat guys? Like, where is the meat? I'm not seeing it. Um, 
So no thank you. Sticking with brand number one, this is just a regular all around adult, healthy, wet cat food. No, nothing prescription here. Um, I expect it to be better than <laughs> the, the dry food, but let's see. We've got water sufficient for processing. Pork, bri bleh, pork byproducts, chicken byproducts, pork liver, chicken, wheat flour, wheat gluten, powdered cellulose, pork digest, brewer's rice flour, pork plasma, natural flavors, modified cornstarch, fish oil, guar gum, um, sodium silico aluminate, calcium sulfate, taurine, potassium chloride, sodium tripolyphosphate, vitamins, yada, yada, yada. It's interesting that they're adding just so many vitamins before the salt when they already have so much meat in here. But again, they're, they obviously are not getting the nutrients they need out of that meat. Otherwise, they wouldn't have to be adding so, so much. Um, I'm trying to find where even is the salt. Salt, salt, salt. Uh, carrageenan. Here we go, guys. This one has carrageenan. Now, what I don't love about it's it's a thickening agent. And what I don't love about it is that there are known digestive issues uh, in both animals and humans. It causes digestive upset. So why would we intentionally feed this to our pets? Um, yeah, I just I don't I don't love this, but. Yeah, the carrageenan is, is a big no for me. So, but let's say this is definitely better than the kibble because there's at least meat in here. So let's move on to brand number two. And I picked a dog food for brand number two. Again, I'm not disclosing brands, but this is brand number two. This is a prescription dry dog food uh, urinary. So whole grain corn is the first ingredient. Chicken meal, again, we know we don't love meal at all. Pork fat, corn gluten meal, soybean mill run, egg product, soybean meal, chicken liver flavor, wheat gluten, soybean oil. No, again, soybeans are <sighs> notorious for glyphosate. Um, they are very heavily sprayed. So the soybean oil is of course going to have, um, the same glyphosate. Uh, we definitely don't want, want to be feeding that to our pets or ourselves. Lactic acid, flaxseed, po pork liver flavor, elizine, calcium sulfate, fish oil, potassium chloride, iodized salt. There's salt divide. Okay, so again, brand two, we're looking at a prescription wet dog food, still for urinary. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about urinary needs um, when I'm done with the slides. But let's just look. So water, we knew we knew that, right? Because this is a wet food. Beef byproducts, again, not necessarily good, not necessarily bad, uh, a thousand fold better than meal, chicken, we have no idea what parts, but okay, that's chicken, rice, whole grain, corn, oh, whole grain corn. <laughs> there wasn't a comma there. Pork liver, soybean oil. Again, we do not want the soybean oil. It has, it's, it's notorious for um, glyphosate. Powdered cellulose, don't like cellulose. Soybean mill run. Again, soybeans, don't like that. Fish oil, calcium sulfate, potassium citrate, potassium chloride, Choline chloride, vitamins, yada, yada, yada. Um, doo, 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 doo. Here's the salt. So I'm looking for, I do not see carrageenan in here, which is good. Um, so definitely, definitely better than the dry prescription urinary food, right? So same brand, brand two, uh, just a regular adult you know, healthy dry dog food. Salmon is the very first ingredient. Now, this is already his entails above the prescription food, right? Um, cracked pearled barley, whole grain oats, brown rice, whole grain corn, corn gluten meal, chicken meal, chicken fat, chicken liver flavor, pork liver flavor, ground pecan shells, <laughs> lactic acid, potassium chloride. Um, let's see, soybean oil, don't like that. But already, okay, there's the iodized salt right here in the middle. 
so let me just see if there's anything. Like, there's a ton of stuff down here. We we don't even, a lot of the stuff we don't love, a lot of them is just added vitamins and minerals because of the loss. Um, I don't, okay, no carrageenan. But same as the number one ingredient. So we're already looking at this and it's head and tails above the prescription dry food. Um, but again, we were looking at urinary. We, we would never want to feed a dry food for urinary issues. Um, brand two, we're sticking with, this is the last one for brand two. It's a, a regular healthy adult wet dog food. Beef broth. How amazing is that? They use beef broth instead of water. Um, all of the nutrients you're going to get from beef broth that you're not getting out of regular water, you get the moisture plus nutrients. That's great. Beef, pork liver, zucchini, carrots, rice, rice starch. Look at how much better this already is than the prescription wet food. I mean, okay, there's caramel color. We know we don't like any colors. Colors are not good. Um, we know they cause, um, they ca well, they cause inflammation. They cause attention disorders in people. So I'm sure they're going to do the same in pets. We're all mammals, by the way. Um, guar gum don't love. So let me just see. I'm scanning to see if I see any carrageenan. I don't see carrageenan. So and now look, one thing I don't love, and I hadn't really pointed this out before. Once we get to the salt, I'm looking for the salt here. I do see at the very, very bottom of the list, green peas, cranberries, apples, and broccoli. So that's kind of a little marketing trick. There's almost, it's at the bottom of the label like this. There's, I mean, trace amounts. So that's just marketing ploys to say that it has these uh, fruits and vegetables in it. You're not, there's, there's not, there's hardly any, I, I highly doubt there's even any nutritional value from these. You'd be much better to add these fresh foods on your own. But, um, so still, I don't love it. Uh, but much better than the prescription, uh, wet dog food from this brand too. Right. So of course there are lots more that we could talk about in a, in an ingredient label, but those are some of the big ones. Now, just for comparison, <laughs> this is a human grade cooked cat food that is available on the market. And guys, it has 86% meat. Like just look at the difference in this label. Turkey thighs, skin on. Chicken liver, green beans, peas, kale, vegetable oil, calcium carbonate, dicalcium phosphate, choline, L- bitter trait. I probably said that wrong. Salt, taurine, magnesium, uh, gluconate, potassium chloride, zinc, gluconate, ascorbic acid, copper gluconate. So now we're looking at all of the, uh, you know, vitamins and minerals that are being added. Now, one thing people often, um, I hear people say is like, I should be able to get all of the nutrients I need for my pet out of whole foods. And while I wish that were true, and maybe 100, 200, 1,000 years ago, you know, wild animals absolutely could get all of the nutrients they need out of whole foods. But if we think about the foods that we're, we have available to us, just look at, I mean, we'll look at meats, look at fruits, look at vegetables. The way that we have farmed them, the way we have raised animals is... <sighs> We have done so in a way that we have modified them so much that the nutrient value of, let's say, a chicken thigh 100 years ago versus the nutrient value of a chicken thigh today are drastically different. The nutrient value of um, a banana or a strawberry of 100 years ago versus today, drastically different. So it's, it's, it's almost inevitable. Like I went down the rabbit hole. I'm not, I went down the rabbit hole. Um, when my cat Sasha got really, really sick and I said, you know what? She got really, really sick. And, and as she was, I actually started the research right before she passed away. And once she passed away, I said, I want to drastically alter my cats, cats, the, the rest of my cats. I wanted to drastically alter their diet. And I was look. I wanted to feed whole foods without supplements as much as possible. I went down a rabbit hole, and it's 
it's almost not possible. And I only throw that in here to say that you're not going to find a label with five things on it. If you find a label with five things on it in pet food, you're probably not getting all of the vitamins and nutrients that your pet needs. Um, I'm not saying it's impossible. I'm saying <laughs> I find it very unlikely. But look at the difference or, or here, right? If you're if you were listening, the difference in this label versus these other foods. Now, again, that's not to say, and, and I, I just actually in a, um, a live I did a couple of weeks ago, I'm not saying like if, if kibble is what you can feed, then do your homework, do your research and feed the best one you possibly can. If you're able to step up to a wet food, good on you. Oh my goodness. Especially, well, I mean, we've seen the difference in the labels in the, even the dog food. It was something that a veterinarian told me many, many years ago that there was no point in feeding a wet food to a dog because it's just the same thing as kibble with water added and dogs are already good at drinking water. So why would you spend the extra money? I find that to be so untrue. (laughs) The more and more I look at these labels now, again, the ingredient label is not the end all be all to the product, but it is a great, great place to start. And it is going to put you on the path to learning more about, you know, and and then looking at the guaranteed analysis. Um, Again, I I went over that live I was just mentioning a couple weeks ago, how to calculate carbohydrates in a dry pet food. So that's one way to realize what you're looking at on a guaranteed analysis label. So when we add all of this in combination with one another, we are so much better informed to make better decisions for our pets. Now, one thing that I didn't mention earlier, and I did want to just throw in here before we talk a little bit more about urinary foods. And the reason I'm, I'm, there are so many different types of prescription and veterinary foods out there, but urinary, um, is the one that I'm most familiar with because it is the one that I used to feed. And I've had cats with urinary, I've had cats with kidney issues as well, but um, I never went down the path of feeding them a prescription diet uh, because I, at the time, researched and 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 learned that that wasn't going to be the best thing for them. But uh, one more thing that I want to mention before we talk more about it is that most pet food companies are not going to do digestibility studies. And if you've never heard of a a digestibility study, I don't blame you. Um, It's basically how the food affects the body and how digestible that food is, how much nutrition your pet is actually getting from that food and how much is being excreted through their feces. Um, One thing I mentioned in the episode about dogs eating poop, I had this really (laughs) um, strange thought uh, when in the shower one night and I tried and I tried and I tried for a while to figure out how to parlay that into a podcast and finally ended up doing the one on um, how, you know, why your dog eats poop and what to do about it. So uh, I would definitely recommend going back (laughs) <laughs> and, and if you haven't heard that episode, don't go back to that one. But I was thinking about dogs eating cat poop specifically and how these pet food companies generally don't do digestibility studies. And why would they want to? It's not required. So why would they spend the extra money? And also, why would they want to find out that it's not that great? Um, and it made me think that if your dog is eating cat poop specifically. Now go back to the episode if you're having that issue, because there's a lot more to this than just what I'm talking about right now. But what, like, have we looked at what we're feeding our cat and the digestibility of that food? Because if there is a ton of nutrients being excreted, (laughs) being, um, that your cat is just passing right through and being excreted in their feces, of course, that is going to look really, really tempting to your dog because there's a lot of nutrition left in your cat's poop. Um, That's really gross to talk about, but it's the reality (laughs) of the situation. So um, just one thing I want to mention, I wanted to mention really quickly about digestibility studies and how most companies are not doing them. You can always contact a pet food company. Um, 
whether or not they're going to answer your questions or answer your questions in a way that is satisfactory to you is another another issue. Um, but you can always, if you have a question, absolutely call them and see what kind of answer you get. And if you're happy with it, great. If you're not happy with it, then I, I think we're lear- we're continuing to learn, right? So um, urinary food in particular, the number one thing we can do for a a cat or a dog that's having urinary issues is increase their moisture content, right? It is so, so, so important. It helps the kidneys flush out the toxins and um, work properly, work better. So if you are, if you have a cat with a urinary issue and you're continuing to feed a dry food, um, we need to figure out some way to get more moisture into your pet, whether that is adding bone broth or water to their dry food. Um, or, you know, unfortunately for some cats, they may need to get, um, fluids. Um, uh, what is it called under, under the skin? They may need to get subcut subcutaneous fluids, um, regularly if they're just not going to drink, but, or, or they're not going to eat the food that has the moisture added to it. Um, switching them to a wet food would be, heads and tails better (laughs) than feeding them a dry, even prescription food, right? Or veterinary food. We've, we've just looked at those labels and we've seen the difference. Um, when we think of cats with urinary issues, a lot of times what, what veterinary medicine knows to do or thinks is best to do is decrease phosphorus, decrease magnesium, decrease ammonia. And the way those are looked at in as far as a kibble food or a dry food is in the ash content. So ash content is generally in most pet foods I've looked at is not listed. Industry average is about 6%. But that is one of the things um, that a prescription or veterinary food looks at doing is decreasing the um, phosphorus that's the number one thing you're going to hear is decreased phosphorus. I find that if we if we are feeding our cats whole food versus processed food, any of us, your cat, your dog, you, are going to process whole foods versus supplements in very different ways versus processed foods in very different ways. So it may not be the end-all be-all to decrease phosphorus, you may be okay with an average level of phosphorus if you are switched to feeding whole, whole fresh foods, if you increase that moisture content for your cat. Now, again, I'm not giving medical advice here, but it is important to know. It's important to educate yourself and learn more and feed the pet in front of you. If you have a cat, a cat or a dog um, with kidney issues, again, the number one thing we see in pets with kidney issues is that they're dehydrated. We want to increase the moisture content. We want to increase the amount of moisture they're getting on a daily basis. A lot of times pets with kidney issues, you know, your vet automatically says, oh my gosh, we have to decrease the protein. And in so many cases, that's one of the worst things we can do because when we decrease the protein in our pet, that we're providing to our pet and our, especially if we're looking at a cat, but even if we're looking at a dog, we decrease the protein we're giving them. Dogs are carnivores. Cats are obligate carnivores. If we decrease their protein, their body is going to be looking for protein sources and they're going to start wasting away because their body is using up and eating away at their muscle mass. It's really, really, especially over an extended period of time, it's really, really nasty, um, not great thing to do. Instead of decreasing protein, we need to increase moisture. We need to decrease stress. We need to add omega-3s and fatty fish oils uh, to help the kidney uh, become less inflamed and work better. So Really, if your pet has, you know, is diagnosed with any illness or disease, of like we said at the beginning, the underlying cause of any disease is inflammation. So let's let's be a little bit more mindful, learn a little bit more. And I said I was going to talk to you briefly about how to go about talking to your vet um, and not being combative with them. Because if you're combative with them, they're going to be combative right back to you. Like that's just human nature. But 
maybe it would be a really good thing to take the two pet food labels to your vet and say, can you tell me the difference and why this one, why you're saying this one is better than this one? I really want to understand and start an open dialogue about about it and and point out the things that you notice that you don't love like the fact that you know the regular pet food label looks so much better at least in the ones that i have found and i just randomly picked these i didn't pick these um labels that i'm showing you for any other reason than like i just randomly found picked them like i i didn't pick them because they looked the way they looked i just picked them and said all right this is what it is and we're going to go over <laughs> the way they are um so you know that that's one one way and i think a really good way to go about opening this dialogue and having this conversation with your veterinarian but again having a care team for your pet can also be so important so i know this was a longer podcast episode, but I really wanted to get as much information in as I possibly could to help you um, understand first and foremost that there is so much information out there. All we have to do is dig in and look for it uh, to make the best decisions we can to be as informed as we possibly can to make the best decisions for our pets health and life so with that i'm going to end this episode uh, really quickly i mentioned earlier there are two amazing veterinarians that i do recommend you check out if you have more questions about prescription or veterinary diets that's dr katie woodley and dr judy morgan uh, so with that i'm going to end today's episode thank you so much for being here as always uh, reach out to me on social media if you have any comments or questions and i hope you join the family over on patreon uh, you can join for as little as a dollar a month. You get lots of extras, bonuses, um, first look content, and you help me to continue bringing this kind of information to pet parents like you. So go to the petparentingreset.com and click on Patreon. Again, you can join for as little as a dollar a month. Can't wait to see you over there. Until next time. Bye, guys. Oh, oh, oh.